Yes. Come on. Uh, Bill wanted me to ask you about editing this order. This much we can say at this moment. The planet Venus is a very hot planet. The atmosphere is dense and its primary constituent is carbon dioxide. There are many mysteries yet remaining about the planet Venus. These mysteries will be solved by further analysis of our present data and hopefully by more experience of this type in the future. NASA, the National Aeronautics and Space Administration presents Aeronautics and Space Reports. Next month, NASA plans to launch an unmanned Mariner spacecraft to the planet Venus. We know very little about Venus because we cannot see through its thick clouds. The 540-pound Mariner will attempt to shed light on the origin and nature of the planet and its environment, giving us additional knowledge about our solar system. Ever since the first people were gazing up at the skies, they had to have noticed Venus. It's so incredibly bright. In the ancient records of the Mayans, the Greeks, the Chinese, people all over the world were seeing Venus up there, naming it and writing all sorts of stories about it. But we could say that the first modern observations of Venus began with the use of a telescope in 1610. 
Galileo, in the early 1600s, turned his telescope on to Venus, and he looked at the phases of Venus, and that really refuted the geocentric model that was in play and commonly accepted. Galileo's observations were one of the first uh, clear examples of how observing another world could tell you about your own. For the next 300 years, Venus continued to be an obvious target for telescopes. These early observations eventually revealed that Venus had a thick, dense atmosphere. This discovery would define our image of the planet. Rather than seeing it as a meandering bright star, Venus was now our mysterious sister planet. Early in the 20th century, we were making huge advances in science in all kinds of different fields. With advances, we started getting observations of Venus using spectroscopy and using ultraviolet wavelengths. The astronomers of the time were making fairly reasonable assumptions that the atmosphere on Venus is very similar to the one on Earth, and that the clouds that they were observing were made up of water vapor. And subsequently, they concluded that the Venetian atmosphere was really wet and stormy, and the surface was swampy. And a lot of astronomers at the time even concluded that it was really good conditions for life. There's never been anything like this before in fact or fiction. First spaceship on Venus. This is it. This is the predicted point of closest approach according to all calculations. NASA's Mariner spacecraft, after traveling four months and 217 million miles, began fulfilling its mission as it rendezvoused with the planet Venus. By 1967, we actually had two successful missions make it to Venus. The first one was the Soviet Venera 4, and nearly a month later it was followed up by the NASA's Mariner 5. The interesting thing about that, that we were in the middle of the Cold War, and despite that, the Soviet and American scientists were working together, cooperated, shared the data, and the picture that the scientists got of Venus was much more inhospitable than they really imagined. By 1967, if there were any doubts about whether Venus was livable or not, those doubts were washed away. Now in an unexplored region of space, Mariner was placed on its Mercury intercept course by the gravity of Venus, the initial target on this first dual planet mission. Mariner 10 took more than 3,500 pictures during its rendezvous with Venus in February. For the first time after a decade of exploration, Mariner 10 was carrying cameras we had ultraviolet cameras. We could actually make some of the most beautiful images. So, I mean, here we have Venus, the goddess of love and beauty, and we had yet to really make a close-up picture of her. Pioneer Venus was the last NASA mission to go to Venus to study specifically its atmosphere in detail in the dynamics of that atmosphere. That was 30 years ago that we sent it there. It took a lot of detailed uh, data that allowed us to test the theories that we had about why Venus was such a strange environment. And one of the most interesting, of course, is this idea of the runaway greenhouse effect as an explanation for why is Venus so super hot. So while the Pioneer Venus orbiter was sending a steady stream of data back to Earth, the Soviet program undertook several more, actually eight missions back to Venus. 
And the highlight of this set of missions was Venera 13 and 14, which made it to the surface of Venus. And while they were active there for 45 minutes, they took a handful of color panoramas of the Venetian surface. Now that they have been reprocessed, they present a stunning view of the Venus surface. And forgetting the heat, toxic atmosphere and the pressure, it really looks tranquil. Venus, the brightest star in the evening sky, has captured our imaginations for centuries. Since August of 1990, though, a spacecraft named Magellan has peered beneath this veil of mystery to show us the surface of Venus in unsurpassed detail. Magellan was a pretty simple and elegant mission. It had one basic uh, purpose, and that was to get a detailed high resolution map of the surface topography of the entire planet. And what we saw was, was an enormous surprise, a very young surface, lots of volcanic features. There were lava plains and volcanoes and all kinds of features. It was an unexpected and, and marvelous revelation of what was underneath those clouds. At this point, the American Soviet space missions are really museum pieces. And while everybody is now excited about the new data and the new pictures, images that we're getting from Mars, Venus is really staying in the shadow right now. But throughout the history, Venus has provided us a lot of wonderful and interesting theories and answers to the questions that we have here on Earth and which shone the light on our space in the universe. But new players are coming into the game, and with the European Space Agency sending a spacecraft there in 2006, and the Japanese Space Agency planning one in 2010, the Venus exploration is going to pick up, and it really seems that a very good opportunity to go back, because there are lots of things that we still don't know. And with nearly two decades passed from the last U.S. mission to Venus, isn't it time we go back? Wow. Uh, hello, everybody. <laughs> it looks like my camera is a little, uh, it's an adjustment here. It's a little hot, isn't it? <clears throat> my camera's not even on, Kent. Yeah, I thought it was. It was on. Now it's off. Now Let's it's on. Do this. Let's there see we go. Happens. There we go. Okay. Wow. Got it adjusted. You had a healthy glow, Scott. I did. <laughs> it was so. a supernova. It was kind of, so. All right. So go ahead. Let's get to everybody who's watching right now yeah you need to if you're watching you want to oh, yeah this uh, make by a the comment. way to start off this oh, is yeah. kent's 70th show for first right first light chronicles now he's done many other shows with us and he, he broadcasts virtually every day on amazon so if you watch amazon live and see our page you'll you'll see him on um but uh uh you know uh, he's done 70 First Light Chronicles, which is quite a milestone. We, we like to, and we like to mark milestones, and we don't have anything that's 75 that I can think of off the top of my head, but we do mm. have some things called 70s. Specifically, specifically, breasts are 70, 70 degree eyepieces. Now, these aren't waterproof eyepieces, and uh, we're going to give one of those away. So we have it's going to be uh, the winner's choice of 25 degree, uh, excuse me, 25 millimeter, 30 millimeter, and 35 millimeter 
IP. You tell us which one we want, we will send it to you. Now, this is good in the United States. Outside the United States, you're going to have to pay shipping and any duty or taxes, but you're going to get a free IP out of the deal. So the other thing we're going to give away is a Galileo scope. Uh, Galileo scope was a project for the International Year of Astronomy, mm -hmm. which uh, marked, I believe, is Galileo's 500th birthday. Uh, back in what 2009 2008 and so uh 400th birthday 400th excuse me 400th 400. birthday yeah. yeah because he he would be uh uh he's what? gonna be like 458 years old yeah something like that uh february the 15th if my memory serves correctly right. and so we thought we'd honor him with the show so the galileo scope is a stem research tool you get to put it together yourself uh and you learn about what's going on inside of a telescope and how to make different configurations of eyepieces. And how we're going to do this is you have to make a comment on whatever platform you're on. And Scott's going to write down your names. And towards the end of the podcast, uh, we are going to uh, list them in the, in the order that Scott had them written down. I don't see the list. I don't know who, what order it is. And he's going to tell me there's 18 of you or 219 or six or and, two uh, or no, two. Yeah. And whatever the number is, and I am going to then put the gross number, the mass number 18 into a random number generator and generate a random number for the eyepiece and then do it again, random number for the Galileo scope. So that's the plan. We're giving away stuff today. Thank you. Galileo for being born. Thank you, Galileo. That's right. <laughs> and however many years. So if Galileo ago. has no other impact on your life. Uh, you might uh, be impacted by other than let's say, IPs. you know, obviously everybody knows him for being the developer, the discoverer, the inventor, or whatever of the telescope. Well, the real story is he didn't invent it. He just figured out an application right. that worked, and he was looking for money and. He saw a military application and started to sell it to the military because, look, it's, it's technology. And if you can see the enemy better than they can see you, you have an advantage. And then he turned the telescope to the sky and discovered the Galilean moons and realized he, he took copious notes. He followed the scientific method. He wrote to, you know, Jamie Heineman or the other guy off Mythbuster says that um, the difference between play and the science and, and science is when you're doing science, you write it down. And Galileo was very good about writing down his notes and sketching what he saw. And with yeah, the course he, of he was a scientist, you know, maybe right, maybe the first of what we would call today a scientist, you know. Right. Well, he no, he he is he is effectively credited with being the first modern scientist in the scientific method. Uh, let me see. I was looking to do some reading here real quick. Uh, Einstein caught, called him the father of, of uh, modern science. Um, I mean, he was um, a, um, on the, everybody, all the science we do today stands on his shoulders. He studied the effects of motion. He tried to prove that, uh, mass did not affect gravity. He understood the parabola and didn't think that the earth was following a parabola, but he was, he, he knew that um, artillery shells traveled in a par parabola and figured out calculation tables for how, you know, how those followed and how to hit. He developed different compasses. He could develop um, uh, thermometers. Again, well, he studied even before Isaac Newton, <sighs> He yes. understood that if you, you know, if, if there was no wind resistance on no two objects at different weights and he dropped them at the same time, that they would hit the ground at the same time. Yeah. There's a story that he dropped balls off the Leaning Tower of Pizza. Pizza. I said pizza. Pizza. Um, there's no nothing in his notes that says that, but one of his uh, uh, contemporaries says that, in fact, he did, but there's no proof that he did. However, they, the guess is that it probably was a thought experiment more, but other contemporaries actually did conduct those experiments, proving that uh, 
spheres of the same size but different mass hit the ground at the same time. And so, uh, but he, he studied motion, rolling down inclined planes, and developed mathematical formulas to explain that. He uh, had mathematical formulas for music. And what I think is astounding is he was the first human to observe the planet Neptune, right? In, I think it was 1612. And he was looking at, at, at moons of Jupiter and sketching the background stars. And he didn't realize over a couple of days that one of those stars actually moved. And he sketched, if you go back using the planetarium program, he sketched exactly what the night looked like and exactly where Neptune was on those nights. He was just one realization away from discovering a planet that took 234 more years to discover. He was right there, right there. And for all his observational powers, he missed that one little thing moving. And he described the Milky Way. He turned his telescope to the Milky Way and realized it wasn't clouds. There were so many stars up there that were so densely packed, the human eye couldn't see them, but the telescope revealed the majesty of the Milky Way. Um, he was the first person to describe craters on the moon. He was the first person to describe mountains and valleys on the moon. It's just astounding what all Galileo did. You know, da Vinci gets a lot of credit for a lot of inventions, but Galileo was, was one of the founding stones of what we, we modernly call science and engineering. It was impressive what he did. Wow. So did I cover anything else, Scott? We can, I guess we can end well, the show now. We could talk about uh, Galileo's middle finger. I don't remember the story about his <laughs> middle finger. <laughs> okay, so when, the, okay. when Galileo died, I think he was That's like right. seven years old. Yes, yes. And even when he died, he was buried. The, the story goes he was buried in a chapel uh, at the Church of Santa Croce, Croce maybe, in Florence. Uh it says nearly a century later in 1737, as the scientist's remains were being transferred to a burial place of honor uh, at the Santa Croce Basilica, three of his fingers, along with a vertebrae and a tooth, were removed from his corpse. Okay. Now, who kept the other stuff? I don't know. Um, but uh, 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 let's see. Uh, two of his fingers along with the tooth were kept by one of his admirers and handed down through the generations of his relatives. Now, how strange is that? Okay. Son, when I pass on to the great beyond, you're going to get Galileo's fingers and this tooth. Okay. Uh, that's really bizarre. Anyways, uh, it says the items were thought to be lost sometime in the early 1900s. Uh, but they were being passed down generation after generation, okay, uh, in his family. In 2009, the two fingers and the tooth appeared at an auction and were snapped up by a private, private collector. So it's still in private hands, no pun intended. Uh, 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 using <laughs> historical documentation, experts later concluded that the items were Galileo's. Meanwhile, the third finger taken from Galileo's remains, the middle finger of his right hand, had been housed at various museums in Italy since at least the first half of the 1800s. The purloined vertebrae ended up at the University of Padua, where Galileo taught from 1592 to 1610. Kind of strange. Kind of strange. Weird. You know, the, 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 you know that, that goes back to the tradition of, you know, storing the bones after the carcasses, uh, the flesh is rotted away to put the bones in ossuaries and, you know, the catacombs under, under, under Paris. And I mean, it's just, it was a whole different way of, you know, thinking about life and death and all those things. So anyway. Um, but, but we're, we're here to talk about the impact of Galileo um, 
uh, Galileo is, uh, you know, is commonly brought up in school uh, uh, curriculum. Uh, he is, um, uh, he is celebrated, uh, uh, you know, each year uh, uh, for his accomplishments. And uh, he, um, I think that a lot of uh, astronomers, I mean, they kind of just see him as kind of like this distant historical figure. I mean, it's only a few hundred years ago. Okay. So uh, I think that, that uh, Galileo actually has a big impact, especially amongst amateur astronomers, uh, because Galileo was the first guy to do outreach in astronomy, you know, which a lot of us do as amateur astronomers. Now, uh, you know, he always kind of had a, he was careful about who he selected to go look through his telescopes, but he did outreach to lawyers, uh, uh, to people that were important, especially in the city of Florence um, and uh, the Medici family and all of that. And it's true, as Kent said, that uh, Galileo saw the telescope as, a, as a, an important military tool. Um, so to kind of show the power of the telescope. Now, Galileo was also, he was a real scientist and he had specific ideas about the, uh, the, the way that we orbit uh, or that the earth moves through space, you know, uh, adopting the idea that, um, uh, that the earth did rotate about the sun, you know, uh, which was contrary to uh, popular and religious belief at the time. And uh, uh, so, you know, the uh, Galileo was, he was a rebel, he was outspoken. Uh, uh, and, uh, you know, he, he was out to prove that, uh, in fact, he was right. Um, he liked to, from what I understand, he liked to uh, portray his knowledge is almost like divinely given. Okay. Uh, so it wasn't just that he was smart, but that he was, uh, you know, uh, a, a divine genius. And so that there was some, there was some uh, uh, scholarly articles about this. Um, uh, the, you know, and of course he, he did not invent the telescope. That was, uh, that's attributed to Dutch uh, spectacle makers, probably Hans Lippershe, you know, being one of them. And potentially like their children ideas. and potentially their potentially their children that's the story right that's the story right playing with discarded that's... pieces of glass that's right and Hans Lipper say wow this has an interesting this application. is cool Galileo <laughs> read about I it like, I like that story I like that yeah. story I like the idea that kids were the ones uh that kind of uh figured that part out you know looking at a weather vane far across the city and that Hans makes um, spotting scopes. Now the spotting scopes at the time were low power, but this makes a big buzz in the, uh, in the, you know, the uh, hierarchy yeah. of society, you know, because this was a new invention and um, the uh, Galileo was anxiously awaiting to see one, okay, to get his hands on one. And apparently one shows up in Florence and he has the opportunity to see it. Now, this is a low power uh, 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 spotting scope, something probably about eight magnification. He does get the credit, Galileo does get the credit. Uh, we're not sure, it's still not known exactly how he arrived at making higher power eyepieces, but um, he is given the credit to polishing lenses that uh, would have, increase the magnification up to about 30 magnification, 20, 30 magnification. He made several telescopes. Um, and yeah, he, he did want to sell it to the government uh, uh, so that the military would have a distinct advantage. He is, uh, he is somebody that's interested in, in astronomy. And, uh, you know, he did look at, at the, the moon of, uh, uh, you know, our moon. And, and uh, uh, he saw, was the first to see the phases of Venus uh, he was the first to uh, document the uh, moons traversing uh, around Jupiter. And he felt that this is all the information that he needed to prove that uh, we were revolving around the sun. So, uh, of course, Galileo was right. Um, uh, his, uh, 
and everybody knows the story about his writings uh, and that uh, he got in trouble with the uh, with the Catholic Church, uh, That's primarily specifically for making, the Pope, <laughs> embarrassing the Pope. Yeah, know? because <laughs> so. he, he used the Pope's own words against him at the end of the book he wrote, and that really made the Pope bad. And oh yeah, it, yeah, it, yeah. You know, so. th there was you know, in many aspects, had he not been who he was and connected politically the way he was, he probably would not have survived the Inquisition. However. Right. He he survived the Inquisition because he at the very end, he was smart enough to go, OK, I can stand on my principles or I can humble myself. Yes. And after his life of being a proud. Plus, voice he was connected. Woman, he was connected with the right people. So but that's still, you know, a, he yeah, may still to save his own right. life, you know, so uh, which for many people in the Inquisition, as we know, was not an option. And they right. went to their dungeon in a less than painless fashion so he, he is uh i mean i think to all astronomers he's uh, a heroic fi figure but he wasn't a perfect guy you know uh he was a college dropout i don't i see no problem with that you know steve jobs was a college dropout um uh you know many brilliant people dropped out of college or university uh he uh had children out of wedlock uh which was i think I don't know how rare or unusual it was at the time, but I, I think that was unusual. His daughters um, uh, were uh, sent off to uh, uh, become nuns. And um, apparently, even though, you know, his trouble, he had troubles with the Catholic Church, uh, he still had close ties with his oldest daughter, who became known as Sister Maria Celeste, okay, which is really cool. Uh, and she sewed for him. She made food for him uh, and did other tasks. And so, um, and uh, apparently Galileo did give food and supplies to the impoverished convent, which is, which is nice, you know, so that's cool. Galileo's son, uh, Vincenzo, was born in 1606 and studied medicine at the University of Pisa. He married well and resided in Florence as an adult. So, um, you know, things, things kind of worked out that way. That's great. Um, but, uh, uh, you know, the, his telescope is still on display, his finger is on display. Um, yeah. and, uh, you know, he lives in our hearts and minds as someone that, uh, uh, propelled us into, uh, the modern science of astronomy. So, so I think that yeah. that's, that's that. I sat here reading a little bit more. I'd forgotten this. He also pro uh, proposed the principle, basic principles of relativity that he, he achieved. How, how so? Because he was, he observed that if you're on a horse and riding along at a, at a certain speed and toss okay. up a steel ball, it looks to you like the ball goes up and comes down, right? Okay. And he observed that if you're standing off to the side, of the same horse and the same guy and the same ball. Oh yeah, you're right riding along. the horse, you throw a ball up in the air, it comes up, comes down, right? Right, it, it goes straight up and comes straight down, right? Okay. Clearly, it goes straight up and straight down. That's what you can see. Observably, that goes straight up and straight down. But if you stand off to the side and watch that Throw horse and ride by, the ball goes up and describes a parabola and comes back down. It follows a curve. And he proposed that, and he used that to talk about why ju just because we're sta standing on the earth, we don't discern the earth moving is the same reason why if you're sitting on a horse and throw the ball up and come down, you don't see the ball move in a parabola it right. goes straight up and comes down that was probably a big argument at the time well galileo i don't feel us moving around the exactly. sun you, that hey, was you the argument really, you know no so right look around we're not moving clearly we're not moving, we're not moving. You know? it, it was just like his observations of the moon observations of sunspots because the, because all those things were were heaven was perfect right mm. Heaven was perfect. Heaven doesn't change. Well, he's looking at the moon and describing a fractured, unclean surface. The sun changes 
and the moons of Gal of, of, of uh, Jupiter rotate around, and he worked out the periodic orbits of all four Galilean moons to a very precise measure. He struggled with Saturn because he looked at it, and when he went back to look at it again, he, he thought there was two bodies, two moons next to it. And when he went back to look at it later, he couldn't see them, so he wrote that the moons had disappeared. What had happened was, if you go back to that time, the edge-on plane of Saturn's ring had changed, and he, when he observed it the second time, he the, the plane was edge-on, and he could not see the rings of Jupiter uh, because they were edge on and invisible to him on earth with his telescope. Um, hmm. A true amazing, amazing person that the more I read about him, the more I wonder, you know, um, Da Vinci um, was not a protege, but um, in many respects, he was much like Da Vinci in his ability to discern many things. Uh, sitting here looking, uh, reading online. Uh, the earliest known pendulum clock was designed by who? Galileo. Wow. He designed the pendulum clock. Now, he he also uh, was, since he couldn't do his astronomy work anymore, he did, he did work in hydrology. He did all kinds of stuff. And from what I understand, even though the guy was, you know, the, uh, uh, he was um, supposed to be thrown in prison and then that got sentenced, got commuted to house arrest. Uh, he did travel um, afterwards. And so it wasn't like, you know, he was totally pinned down. It was more like you can't ever talk about, you know, your ideas, you know, your fancy ideas about astronomy. So um which is kind of a shame because who knows what else he would have done, you know, had he been able to uh, pursue that. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. All right. So how many people we got on? How many, we got some shout outs to give. Uh, let's see. We've got. And write their names uh, down. Don't... Yeah. 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 Here. Uh, um, Chris Larson was the first now, one. Don't, to on. don't, got... don't, no, no, no. Don't say them huh? in order because that affects my randomness. I want this to be random. I'm so going to randomize, get... this, randomize the list. Okay, I'm going to randomize right. the list and then okay. you can random, randomize it. All right. Okay. Have, that'll work. Then we have Mike Wiesner, uh, who signed on, Martin Eastburn, Beatrice Hines, Pekka Hautala, Chris Larson, Jim's Astro, Jim Norwood, Chuck Sta, Shailendra Sharma, otherwise known as Shailendra Sharma, Harold Locke, and um, uh, Paul uh, Burgart. And um, I think that is everybody. I mean, just if you didn't hear your name being called out, a couple uh, minutes, you might about want five to minutes. write your name, you know, say something in chat. So I got you. Let's see. Because right now, everybody's name he just read is. Oh, here we go. We got nobody else signs. We on. got here we are in Mish. OK, in Mish. Now, remember, if you win and you're not in the United States, you have to pay shipping and duty. But you want an eyepiece or a Galileo scope. Harmony Smurf. Okay. And I think, I think that's everybody. Okay, so now I'm going to randomize this. Let's give it another few seconds because it takes time. Let's get make sure nobody else weighs in. Come on. One minute, jump in. I want everybody in that listening to get a chance. Hurry up. Chop, chop. Anybody else weighing in, Scott? Yeah. Oh, James Dugan. Okay. I mean, if you don't enter, you can't win. Literally. <laughs> James says, I'm jumping in. <laughs> okay. Let's see. Uh, All right. So. Okay. You've randomized your number, right? I have. Okay. Um, let me get up in a random number generator. Okay. And Pekka says double Pekka. Double Pekka. Uh, how many entrants do we have, Scott? Total number. 14. 14. Okay. 
So the first number I'm going to generate is going to win the uh, eyepiece. The second number I generate is going, it's going to be the same generator, is going to be um, uh, the Galileo scope. So here we go. I'm clicking. We have 1 to 14. We're going to generate the number. And the number mm -hmm. for the eyepiece is number 6. Number 6. Let's see. Who, who might that be? Oh, trying to get the drum roll up. Harold Locke. Harold hey, Locke. Okay, hey, Harold. Hey, that's right. And Harold, we've got Harold. Uh, uh, tell us what size eyepiece you want. It's a 25 millimeter, 30 millimeter, or 35 millimeter. And we have your address. I'm writing that down. Tell me which eyepiece you want, and we'll get that for you. Okay, so here we go. The next random number that's going to win the Galileo scope, and you can't win twice. If we come up with six again, uh, Harold can't win. It's going to be somebody else. Here we go. Three, two, one, click. Then click. Three, two, one, click. Number three. Okay. Um, number three. Number three is going to be Chris Larson. Hey, think, Chris. I think we have Chris's address. I'll check real quick. Uh, I'll click the wrong thing. So I know we have Harold. Um, not that database. Let me check one other one then. I can't be amazed if we don't have his address. Standing by. Okay, so Chris, you're listening. Um, do you live in Jackson, California? And you can reply in the message. And if you live in Jackson, California, we have you. If we don't, then it's another Chris Larson. And you just need to message us uh, separately outside of the chat function, your address. So if nothing else, you can send your, ad, send your address to Explore Alliance at explorescientific.com. So, <laughs> so what's Harold want? Has he swayed in yet? Uh, Chris, Chris Larson, uh, not yet. Let's see. Not, he's not saying where we'll find out. Yeah. Okay. We don't, we, we, we don't have to run him down at the ground. Harold, Harold will take the 14 though. <laughs> uh, we don't have a 14. Sorry. Gotta be a 25. Yeah, but Harold didn't 30. win. <laughs> Harold Lock won the eyepiece. No, Chris Larson won the eyepiece. No, Chris Larson won the Galasco. Oh, that's right. That's right. Yeah. Sorry about that. All right. He wants the 14. He doesn't get if a 14. There is no 14. Which one is, it's is a 70, available? It's close. 70 degree. Yeah. 25, 30, or 35. 25, 30, or 35. Now, the 30 and the 35, and I think maybe even the 25, the 25 are 25 inch are eyepieces. Two, that's correct. They're two inch eyepieces. All of these are two yeah. inch eyepieces. Yeah. So waiting for Harold to weigh in. Okay. Something else while we're waiting for for Chris to weigh in. And Chris, if, just send your address to Explore Alliance at explorescientific.com. We'll get that shipped out to you. Yep. So did y'all see where SpaceX lost 40 satellites in a launch uh, oh, no. two days ago? It um what happened? Uh, there was a geo, there was a solar storm that changed the density of the atmosphere that they had calculated. Oh, my God. And it, it increased the drag by, drum roll, please, 50%. And wow. So they put, they put all the satellites into safe mode, which means they fly edge on, the least resistance, and they lost contact with 40 of them. These are all designed to burn up and never strike the ground. So uh, all of them have burned up by now. And apparently nine are still functioning. So, um, you know, when, you know, many people are going, win one for the astronomers, 
you know, but uh, because it was a launch of 49 and 40 of them didn't make it. It just shows you how space weather, you don't think about it. It doesn't change our density down here enough for us to notice, but it changed the density of the atmosphere 130 miles up or 120 miles up enough to where there was so much drag that down they came. So, uh, you know, that's an interesting phenomenon you don't think about very often. Uh, This is interesting. Space time with Robert. He had just signed on. He says, hello, sorry I'm late. I got a Galileo scope. Awesome. It's awesome. Uh, So he says, uh, Galileo's dad was a musician and you can Uh find his lute songs online. You know, I was, uh, that's the mathematics of, of, of stretching strings was one of Galileo's experiments. And they realized that if you could, if you cut the strings length in half, you changed it by a very specific mathematical amount and can make harmonious music by cutting the links into quarters and eighths and halves, as opposed to just random links. You could control the sound by the length of the stretched string uh, based on his dad's uh, lute um, instruments. So very cool. Very cool. You know, it and truly Harold is. Harold wants to take the 25. The 25. Okay, Harold, we'll get yeah. that dispatched. You'll like it, Harold. Yeah. Now, it's not a waterproof eyepiece, so don't go swimming with it. Yeah, don't put it in your dishwasher. You know, we, we, we have some waterproof. We've talked about this and never done it. We have some waterproof binoculars, and I want to go to a scuba diving place and go underwater scuba diving and video the scuba diver using the waterproof binoculars just to prove how waterproof they are. Oh. We just never... One time I went to, I, I went on vacation and I like to go snorkeling. And so I took a pair of what our waterproof uh, binoculars and, and I did try to use them underwater. Uh, you need extraordinarily clear water to get good use out of a pair of <laughs> binoculars. I would, I, would, I would think so. And they yeah, have to the, have really. The, 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 the dust and dirt and all the rest of the stuff that might be, it makes the water just slightly mercury. Murky looks very murky with binoculars on. Just like, just like scene is poor yep. with a telescope, you're yes. magnifying the scene. If there's, if the water is murky, you're magnifying the murky. Same thing. So I just read another sent here reading again. Galileo is credited with being the one of the first people to understand sound frequency by scraping a chisel at different speeds. He likened the pitch to the sound produce of the pitch of the sound to the spacing of the chisel skips. Effectively, he was measuring frequency. And he described that in a, in a paper. A truly amazing person that we label simply as the inventor of the telescope. Amazing. I uh, just very cool. You, you read yep. more and more about him. It's just amazing, truly amazing. Okay, someone in chat mentioned, you know, uh, when did Galileo burn his eyes? Now we know that Galileo uh, did see sunspots on the sun, uh, but um, uh, and that he did become blind. Uh, but um, uh, he started studying the sun at the age of forty-eight. Now, everybody also talks about, you know, uh, most of the people that you see in astronomy are older and why aren't there more young people? Galileo was 45 when he started doing his work with the telescope. OK, so uh, that's about the medium age, median age today uh, for people getting seriously into astronomy, although more and more young people get involved every day. Uh, but that's that's a little side thing. Uh, uh, his uh, in his letters, his sunspot letters um, to uh, Mark Walzer, uh, uh, his first letter dated May 4th, 1612, mentions observing the sun directly, but only for but only at sunset. OK, so um, uh, so uh, in his final paragraph, he mentions that his pupil uh, Mundero uh, Castelli had, has discovered a better way to observe. This projection method 
he was projecting the sun, okay, is described at length in his second letter. Um, Galileo was so enthusiastic about the superiority of this projection technique that it seems unlikely he ever observed the sun directly again. So he observes it during sunset, um, you know, and I'm sure even during sunset, he's like, oh, wow, that's, that's really bright. So, uh, but uh, uh, I will, but I will say, I want to weigh in here. I have spread what, you know, because you, you, there was actually, I looked that up. There was yeah. an act, there was a gut, there was a NASA website that existed, a web page that existed up until 2010 that explained that Galileo lost, blinded himself in one eye and the other eye. Um, it disappeared in 2010, but the a version of it was preserved on the Wayback Machine. So even NASA was saying that. Okay, oh, NASA was saying it. Even too, so. NASA was saying it. But right. since then, the more reading as recently as probably a year ago. I had been saying that I was spreading urban myth, urban legend or whatever. Um, there's no direct evidence that he did that for the many reasons. And he did develop blindness at the age 72, uh, suspected to be a combination of what it say, glaucoma and uh, cataracts. Yeah. Yeah. So there you go. Uh, you know, so um so anyhow, uh, that's that's that is kind of a urban myth, I guess, uh, or it's being classified as an urban myth at this point. Um, Pekka wanted to talk about his binoculars a little bit. Uh, he says, I got my 1042 waterproof binoculars and they are brilliant and better at what I ever have had before. So 3D view they give uh, and clear stars. Who said That's that? Great. Pekka. Pekka. Oh, great. Yep. A good pair of binoculars, even inexpensive yep. binoculars, are fantastic binoculars. You know, uh, it's amazing the quality of, of our, our, our six by 21 binoculars for 25, 27 bucks, let alone a really high end pair. Oh, right. high end hmm. pair, Scott. We have something to talk about. Let's yeah. See here. Let's mine are out of the truck. Do you have yours? No, here's a pair. No, mine are at home. I've got a pair. I've got one pair. Let me get a box here to start off the show with. We introduced and talked about a new product yesterday. And uh, here's the box. Can you see? Yeah. That? Nice. Oh, look at that. What does that say on there? ED glass. By 56. Yeah. Eight by 56 binoculars i have them out in my truck i didn't bring them in because they think about it here both objective lenses for this are bigger than any of galileo's telescopes yeah uh, and, and the clarity of the glass and quality of the manufacturing is okay. frankly astounding here's a pair of the 10 by 42s you have the 8 by 42s which are going to be you know, yes. eight by forty two is the yeah, favorite the size, size and everything it's for just bird different. watching. Yeah. yeah, and they have these removable uh, flip up eye cups. The standard, this ED glass twist up eye cups, easy smooth diopter, really really yeah. smooth diopter adjustment for your and, right and eye. An open bridge design, so you can get your hands wrapped yep. all the way around them. Get your hands in there. This is a really comfortable pair of binoculars uh i used the eights and tens a couple of nights ago last night it was it was cloudy after i got out of a class i teach and uh i said i'm not even going to do it waiting for a better clear sky and the moon is very uh interfering getting close to being a full moon so i'm gonna wait to after the full moon we don't have a price on these yet we should have a price next week and there's gonna be for explore alliance members special pricing we'll have that Hopefully next week and get it announced. So new Explorer Scientific, uh, eight by forty two, ten by forty two, and yeah. eight by fifty six. Uh, good for astronomy. Good for birding. Um, gonna be a good price. Wrap these back up so they stay clean and get them back over there off my desk somewhere else. So, so, so Ben Crossway watching on Facebook uh, had a question tripod with a question mark. Uh, Yes, um, uh, we don't have a specific tripod for it because any photo tripod can work with it as long 
is you buy uh, a binocular um, a tripod adapter. And so there's a, there's a threaded screw that comes out the, off the front of those binoculars. And by the way, most binoculars have this, okay? So it's pretty standard. So you can put a tripod adapter onto almost any pair of, um, of full-size binoculars. And, um, and, and so that's, that's what it is. Uh, Robert, Space Time with Robert wants to know what's so special about ED glass. ED means extra low dispersion, okay? And it was a breakthrough technology um, when it was first invented. Um, when it was first invented, it was invented for microscopes for little tiny uh, pieces of ED. Uh, uh, so, so imagine you grind a lens. It's to form an image with a lens, it's gotta be thick in the center and then it tapers off to the edges. Well, if you look at that, that tapering, that creates kind of a prism effect. And so as light goes through a prism, it splits the colors of light in, into the, like the, all the colors of the rainbow. ED glass doesn't separate the colors of the light. Its atomic structure uh, prevents and, and uh, this spreading of the colors. And so uh, it's, it's a really breakthrough uh, uh, glass technology. Over the years, they were able to make larger and larger pieces of ED. Uh, Back in the 1980s, I think the largest piece of uh, ED glass that I ever saw was something like four inches in diameter. They now go larger than that. But uh, ED glass, as it gets bigger, gets more and more and more expensive. It's, it's like a, a gem or something. So, um, but uh, the special part about it is that ED glass, uh, when used with the right combinations of other glasses, can virtually eliminate chromatic aberration. And so that's the colors that you might see around a bright star or a bright planet. Typically it's going to be red and blue because those are on the ends of the rainbow of our, of our vision. And so that's what you see first is red on one side, blue on the other. Uh, typically is what you see um, because you're looking at different sides of the rainbow. Um, and uh, it just makes things look sharper because the contrast kicks up. Right, okay? right. And it just, it's brighter. The coatings, the modern coatings, the better glass, the computer modeling they can do and engineering of the structure of the glass and the new coatings they have all combine to really make a modern binocular far better than a pair of, you know, leftover Korean era binoculars, which by the way, I have from my dad, um, you know, and they're fine binoculars, but you go to a modern pair of binoculars and put them beside a pair that's 15 or 20 years old. Oh yeah. No and comparison. It's, there's no comparison. Right. There's no comparison. Yeah. yeah. Right. I, I posted the article about, uh, you know, the reference about the sun and Galileo, which is a common, you know, it's a common myth. So that's, uh, that's that. Um, so very interesting, very interesting. Um, and I don't know what else to uh, describe about Galileo, except that, uh, you know, I often wonder, you know, what Galileo would think about all of the accolades attributed to him or what he would have thought that, you know, when the uh, Catholic Church, Roman Catholic Church, basically absolved him of, uh, of his uh, assertion that the earth uh, rotated, uh, you know, orbited the sun, they did, that happened in 1992, you know, um, you know, so it's, uh, and then, you know, the Galileo spacecraft, um, uh, uh, you know, uh, celebrations about Galileo, uh, uh, you know, uh, people who, uh, actors who portray Galileo and stuff. So I just, I really wonder what he would have thought of all of that. And, and I wonder how stunned, and I'm sure he would have been utterly blown away to see images through uh, backyard telescopes and then to see things like uh, images through the Hubble Space Telescope. I, I, I'm sure it would just blew his mind. So, yeah. It was, it's just amazing. The more I read about him, the more amazed I am. And, yes. you know, that's uh, 
I'm going to do more deep diving into him just to uh, learn more about what he did and read some of the more uh, citations. Uh, that's where you learn. If you go to Wikipedia and read on Wikipedia, that's one thing. What you want to really learn, go to the sources cited down at the bottom. Right. That takes you to a deep dive. And if, if you've never done that before, that's a great technique to really learn stuff is get in that deep dive of the papers and the, the stories that are cited on Wikipedia. It becomes very uh, good educational material. So anyway, right. we have two winners, Scott. Has Chris? Um, Chris Larson. Yeah. Has he confirmed he lives in a certain town that I said? Because uh, I, I, I'm shocked we don't have his address. There's only one I can come up with. Chris, if you're still listening, uh, why don't you send um, yeah. uh, us your address to explorealliance at explorescientific.com and we'll take care of it. Um, and Jim Zastro says he had seven by 35 Kmart focal brand. Hey man, I am a big fan of Kmart focal telescopes and focal optics, which are no longer of course made. This is a 1970 40 millimeter refractor, roughly probably a little bit larger aperture than what Galileo had, um, uh, but uh, probably about the same focal length, so. Okay, that telescope right there is very important to me because <laughs> I wouldn't be sitting here if a 10-year-old Scott Roberts had not received that telescope true. in it's 1970 true. because right. without that telescope, Scott very easily may not have launched down his pathway that resulted in us talking to you right now. That's right. So, That's right. you know, when people, you know, dis small. And there's a direct line from this telescope to Galileo scope. So, yeah. You know, that's that's true as well. So and when people diss small telescopes, I tell that story, you know, hmm. yeah, it's a tall. It's a small telescope. You can it's hear a, this kind of story from a lot of people. I mm -hmm. mean, astronauts and scientists and you know, doctors and all kinds of people that uh, uh, have uh, adopted technology jobs, um, you know, uh, were inspired by science. Uh through a telescope. So, and a lot of times that was a toy telescope. So I keep it on my desk as that kind of constant reminder as well. Well, Kent, thank you so much. Uh, uh, next Tuesday is the 83rd Global Star Party. And that is the, that's gonna be on the birthday of Galileo, which is February 15th. I'm gonna try to find out if there's any record of when maybe time of day that he was born or whatever, um, but uh you know, thanks for tuning in today. Thank you for tuning in to last night's Global Star Party. Uh, Beatrice Hines is watching um, uh, today. Happy birthday uh, to her. Yeah, and she gave a, uh, she gave a, a great presentation, you know, on Global Star Party. So that was wonderful. Um, and Becca says, I'm so happy that Scott got that scope so we can all enjoy these broadcasts today. Thank you. That was very kind of you, Becca. Anyways, uh, keep doing as uh, my my um, long long lost friend uh, uh, Jack Horkheimer used to say is to keep looking up, folks. So we'll be back, and um, until that time, uh, you know I'm wishing you clear skies. So let's see. Anything else you'd like to say? No, nah, I just appreciate everybody joining in. It. It's great okay. fun. Great fun. All right. Take care. Bye, everybody.